is the pearl of great price. This is taken from the 13th chapter, the Gospel of Matthew, 45th and 46th verse. It's all about the kingdom of heaven. First of all, let us say the kingdom of heaven is simply that state in which man rises, where everything is completely subject to his imaginative power. He is destined to be an heir, one with his power and with God, where everything is put under his power. Oh, here is a quote from this 13th of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. It is my hope that I can bring you to that pearl tonight. You may not value it to the point where you're willing to sell all that you have to buy it. But I will tell you of this pearl. Very few are willing to sell all and buy the pearl. But that we now quote from another passage of the Gospel. The eleventh chapter of the book of Luke, the 21st to the 23rd. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when one stronger than he assails him and overcomes it, he takes from him the armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. The very next lie, as though it's an afterthought, throws all the light of the world upon that statement. He who is not with me is against me. There is no benevolent neutrality, none whatsoever. He who is not with me is my enemy. He is against me. So we find the one who is completely in control of this kingdom of heaven. I tell you, that being is called in scripture Christ. But Christ is defined as the power and the wisdom of God. The first chapter of the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Don't look for a man. A man is only the instrument through which this power and this wisdom is exercised. But Christ himself is the power and the wisdom of God. You and I are the instrument through which this power and this wisdom is exercised. So Paul makes the statement, from now on, we will regard no one from the human point of view. Even though we once regarded Christ from the human point of view, we regard him so no longer. You're taking notes? That's his second letter to the Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse. From now on we regard no one from the human point of view. Even though we once regarded Christ from the human point of view, we regard him thus no longer. And then he, the author of that statement, defines Christ's power. Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Now we are told, by him all things were made. And without him was not anything made 
that was made, but nothing. And so we invite you now to trust Christ in you. Again from the letters of Paul, the 13th chapter, the 5th verse. In fact, read it through to the 7th verse. But I'll quote you the 5th. Examine yourself to see whether you are holding to the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in thee? And thus, of course, you fail to meet the test. I hope you will discover that we have not failed. And then he gives us a warning. For now you speak it only of power. Power and wisdom. Personified in the form of one called Christ, Jesus. And now he warns us. I hunt. And I'll pray to God that you do not use it in the wrong way. Even if you think, he's implying now, that I have not used it to the full of my knowledge, I rather you hear and feel that I have made a mistake or I have failed and that you use it evilly. Implying, stating quite openly, you can misuse power. Every one of the world is using this only power, but they don't know it. So he's trying to bring us to the knowledge of this power and the wise use of it. It's called, as we first quoted it, it's called the pearl of great price. So great is this pearl, so valuable, it takes everything that you own to buy it. Now, you don't go and liquidate your stocks and bonds. You don't sell your home. You don't sell anything in the world. But it takes everything that you now believe in, other than it, to pay for it. You believe in astrology? You've got to sell it. You believe in numerology? In teacup leads? In numerology and all these things? No matter what you believe in is a power to control you, you've got to sell it. It takes the belief, all of these beliefs, and you've got to sell them. It wasn't to buy them from you, but you give them up as valueless. Therefore, there's no price attached, no value whatsoever. But you can't hold on to one thing you now believe in is a power that controls your life and still hope to buy the pearl of great price. Everything you now believe in, whether it be even the drugs that you take, even the things, the diets, if you're a vegetarian, you think that's the way to God. If you're a meat eater, you think that's the way to God. If you are a non-smoker, non-drinker, that's the way to God. Or if you are a smoker and a drinker, and that's the way to God. There is no way to God but Christ. I am the way. There is no other way. Way to what? To everything in this world, but especially to the Father. No one comes unto the Father but by me. And here he defines it that he is the only way in the world to everything in this world that you and I seek. And it takes everything that we own as to beliefs that we think are powers to guide our life to pay for that pearl of great price. If you think for one moment you can hold on to one little thing in the event this doesn't work, you can't buy the pearl. So when I buy the pearl, I go all out and live by it. And there is no other being in the world, just this pearl. And I live by it. And this pearl is your own wonderful human imagination. That's Christ. Now I see her in the audience tonight. Last Friday night, this sweet lady told me the story. She went into the baker to buy the usual things that we buy when we go to a bakery. 
And the lady who waited on her didn't look well. And she, without asking the reasons for her present appearance, in her own mind's eye, when she got home, she talked to her as though she stood before physically. She didn't sit down, she didn't relax, didn't go into a trance, just brought her before her mind's eye, and heard her say that she felt so well, and she complimented on the way she looked, she looked so well. And this was a communion between two souls, how she looked so well. And she believed in the reality of her imaginal act. One week later, she goes back into the same bakery. And here is this lady, same lady, but radiant. So radiant, it prompted a response from this one. And she said, but you look so well. What has happened? Well, she said, this past week, I inherited some money. Paid all of my bill. I paid everything that I owed in this world. And so I have no debts, and I have money. Now this lady is totally unaware of the gift she received from the lady who was present here tonight. Totally unaware of it. Now listen to these words, and try to put any other interpretation upon them in the world, and then tell me if you can. This is from the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. You don't need the consent of any being in this world to hear good news for them. You don't have to say, do you want me to hear it? Do you want praise? If you ask them in advance, should I hear good news for you? You're only asking. If they have that it works, they'll praise you or in some way give you something. You don't ask anyone for their permission to hear good news. For in as much as you have heard it, as you've done it, to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And when you did not do it, you did not do it unto me. At the every moment of time, there's the opportunity to do it unto Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus be your own wonderful human imagination. And to see man in need and not act in your own wonderful imagination as she did is to keep the wounds open and to bear up more and more stripes upon the body of Christ Jesus. For the only Christ Jesus is in you, as your only wonderful human imagination. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Come just yourself and see. What a wonderful invitation. Trust yourself. How will I test myself? Well, this is how you test yourself. I tell you that if you imagine, as this lady did, that someone stands before you in bodily form but cannot be seen with your mortal eye. But actually you imagine they are standing before you and you carry on a conversation with them from the premise of your fulfilled desire for them. And then you feel them as you would feel them were they now solidly present. And you believe in the reality of that imaginal act is done. And how it happens, you need not be concerned. It has its own manner of externalizing itself within their world. All you need do is do it. As told us in the first chapter of the book of Jade. When he said, receive with meekness the implanted word. The word is called Christ Jesus, the power and the wisdom of God. But be ye doers of the word, and not merely hearers, deceiving yourself. So when he tells me to be the doer of the word, the world thinks it means to go out and make some physical effort. No. James is not telling me to substitute works for faith. Works are the evidence as to whether the faith that I profess 
is alive or dead. If it's alive, if it is alive, I won't act upon it. If it's not alive, well then, I won't act upon it. I am yet worth the pearl of great price. When I will buy the pearl at great price, there is no other power like it. I sell all in this world to buy it. I sell all beliefs in powers other than my own wonderful human imagination. And everyone, because he has imagination, and everyone can imagine, and everyone can believe in the reality of his imaginal act, he is free, sets a man free. For we are told, you believe my word, and abide in my word, then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, how does he define the truth? That I am the truth. He said, if you know my word, you know the truth. And I am the truth. If you abide in this, then you'll be set free. Be that if I simply imagine that I am the man that I would love to be, that's all that I need you, but just to try it. Imagine that you are already the man that you would like to be. The woman you would like to be. Your friends are all, total strangers are, as you would like them to be. Just imagine it, try it. Test yourself and see. As you trust yourself, and it happens, well then, can you turn back to the belief in any power outside of Christ Jesus? It's finding who he is, and I tell you, Christ Jesus is your own wonderful human imagination. Christ in you must resurrect. And so you start to exercise. Believe in it. Believe in the Lord Christ Jesus and be saved. And so I begin to believe in him. But all oh, I trust in him. It doesn't matter where I start in life. Behind the eight ball makes no difference. I start believing in him. And only in Christ Jesus. And I take off from there. Giving my entire life to him just as though there were no other. Just Christ Jesus, and I have found that he is my own wonderful human imagination. When I believe in him to that extent, things happen. Now she tells me the same lady, that's why I named this tonight, the Pearl, our great price. She had a dream. Here was all mud, nothing but mud, whirling mud. And as it whirled and whirled and whirled before her mind's eye in her dream, she noticed a small, perfectly beautiful, perfect pearl. And she picked it up and held this perfect pearl. It wasn't big, but it was a perfect pearl in her hand. And then she woke. Now this pearl she found in the series of experiences that she conducted. For a boy came east, came from the east to the west, with instructions that if he couldn't find a job in the immediate process, he had to return to the east. And so she simply, on a Friday night, saw him, not frantically, but in her mind's eye, as though he stood before her frantically, and congratulated him on the job, just as though he were a true physical contact on Monday the while he got the job and therefore did not have to return to the East Coast. Now here is a young lady. I call her a young lady. She can't be more than her. Early twenties. I looked at her through my eyes. All things being relative, she has three little babies. But I wouldn't think she's more than her early twenties. I'd be surprised if she passed beyond the middle twenties, looking at her. Born in Italy, of a Catholic family, Catholic faith, brought to this meeting of ours by her mother-in-law, and adopted this concept of Christ Jesus. Our family despairs because they think, unless you have their concept of Christ Jesus, there is no entrance even 
to the kingdom of heaven as they understand it. But I tell her she's well into it. She's exercising the only Christ Jesus of the world. He calls upon us to test it every moment of time. But you can't buy it unless you pay the price. And the price, it takes everything that you have to buy it. Listen to the merits. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearl. Hey. Finding one pearl of great value, went and sold everything that he had and bought it. Everything, not a few things. The average person would say, well, after all, I know. That's all one and good, but F Sanka does keep me in a state of sleep, and normal coffee keeps me awake. And I know that an extra martini does so and so to me, and I'll, I'll take not. Or maybe I should take vodka because it's good for my breath and not the martini. And a thousand things in the world people have concerning what they should do. But they believe in a power outside of Christ Jesus. You give up. As you give it up and hold on to him and only to him, then you bought the pearl. And then you exercise the greatest value in the world, and that's Christ Jesus. So here she has tonight. I would think she has the pearl of great pride. I hope you tonight will accept it. You know, not everyone who finds Christ Jesus sought him, you know. They are brought to him by one who found him. In the gospel, Philip found it. And then he brought his friend Nathaniel. Nathaniel wasn't seeking him. Nathaniel was waiting for things to happen. For he knew the scripture backwards. When Nathaniel heard that the Messiah had appeared, he said, what? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Jesus said of him, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. He knew his scripture. Peter wasn't seeking him. His brother Andrew found him. Andrew went and called his brother Peter. said, we have found him of whom Moses in the law spoke. And all the prophets spoke. So they were not looking for him. But they found him because someone found him and was so interested in what they found, they wanted to share it with the world that they love. For if he is all that we claim that he is, we can't keep it to ourselves. We have to share it. And so maybe this night, a total stranger may be here, who is really not overly eager to change their concept of Christ Jesus. They aren't seeking another concept of him at all. And maybe you will be interested enough to test what I'm talking about and see if this is not Christ Jesus. Or listen to it, by him all things are made. And without him, there was not anything made that was made. Well, now here a lady brought into be something that she had imagined. Without devising the means by which it would happen, she simply imagined it. Didn't she make it? She certainly made it, without the consent of the world for whom she made it. For if she made it, and all things are made by him, she then will say to herself, well, how did I make it? I only imagined it. Therefore, he must be imagination. And this being in action must be imagining. There it is. So she found it. She tried it again, and it worked. And someone tries it a third time, a twelfth time, a hundred times, and it works. If I say this to someone in the world, and they would even try it, well, you know, in science, to demand proof. If one are willing to make the experiment, is nonsense. It's only through the experiment, and it's working out in performance, that proof can be received by us. So to demand proof before I make the experiment is stupid. So, I say to the world, if there is evidence 
for a thing, then what the world thinks about it or even wishes for it is nothing to the point. Makes no difference whatsoever what the world thinks about this, if I can prove it in performance. If I say to you, take a friend who is now unemployed and bring him before your mind's eye as the lady did and see him now gainfully employed. He need not be physically present, but he is not physically present. But you treat him as though he were, and put your mental hands upon him, and give him the solidity that it would be would be there, were it true. And then carry on a mental conversation with him from the premise that it is true. And hear him tell you that he is gainfully employed, and that he loves what he is doing. There is such opportunity, such growth in what he is doing. And do nothing outside of that. For this new merits of Paul concerning Christ. Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. It's not only power, blind power, it's wisdom, the wisdom of God. If it's the wisdom of God, it knows how to navigate the whole vast world and move it to bring this one into a gainfully employed state. All you need to do is believe in Christ Jesus, and that is the pearl of great price. No power in the world can stop it. All it needs is acceptance on the part of us. So, Ken, when there is a strong man, and he's fully armed, and he guard his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when one stronger than he assails him and overcomes it, he takes from him the armor in which he believed and then disposes of the spoil, divides the spoil. Now, but wonderful statement, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scattered. It's so irrelevant to that theme that preceded it and it throws all the light in the world upon that statement. Some power in the world comes in man's mind. It's Christ Jesus. And you don't need a social stand, financial background, intellectual background, any of these background to feel secure in the world. You found it. And this is the one who will overcome all the powers of the world. And if you are not with him, then you are against him. You wouldn't think that. In this world today, we have countries that are called neutralist countries. Benevolent neutralists. Not in scripture. You're either with me or you're against me. You're either with me or you are my enemy. Can you imagine that? I am either part him or I am his enemy. Can't be natural. I either believe in it or I don't believe in it. And of the 900 million Christians in the world, how many really believe in the true Christ? They believe in lighting a candle. They believe in chain of action. All the other things in the world. I wouldn't criticize any of them, leave them, until they find the true Christ. When they find the true Christ, then it doesn't really matter whether you eat meat or don't eat meat, whether you drink or don't drink, whether you smoke or don't smoke, or don't smoke. Whether you do any of these things, it makes nothing whatsoever to do with the true Christ. Or you do not give power to anything outside of Christ. And Christ is your own wonderful human imagination. That's right. When you go before anyone, don't even take thought as to what you're going to say. Just imagine the end. And have him pronounce his judgment based upon the end you had predetermined. Do that. Live this way in the world, trusting 100% in the pearl of great price. May I tell you, it will not fail you. But you can't modify it. You can't hold back one little reserved thing. I am speaking from experience. 
not knowing that it was my own imagination that predicted accurately through the medium of the cards and the medium of the star. I held back a little reserved note in my mind's eye when I found Christ. I would still have in my mind's eye my own horoscope. I could quickly arrange its progression. I would know the day and justify fate. So the rule of my second house, in conflict with the rule of my sixth, can get the job. No money to it. It's all there. It's all in my mind's eye. I will have to completely give it up and so turn up my horoscope in my mind's eye. It doesn't exist. I had to completely destroy it as a power that guided me. I held it because I successfully plateau events for unnumbered people in New York City. I had almost the entire metropolitan crowd, the entire metropolitan opera that came to me. And I so believed in what I did, I predicted with conviction. It worked, and there was a sound on it. Then I had to have an experience one day. To show me it was only my own intense belief in these little symbols that made them work. And I came into my brain's home that I taught her how to read charts, how to set them up. Her name was Carpenter, Norma Carpenter, and I taught her. And then, having retired from a teaching profession in Scranton, Pennsylvania. She had a small pension from the rail, railroad where her husband worked, plus a small pension from her former job. So she eked out a living, but now she could augment it in a nice way by telling and reading charts. And I taught her how to do it. When I came to a place one day, she lived in the hotel. Normal was in tears. I said, what's wrong, Norma? Well, she said, a man called me up. He was recommended by a friend of mine. And he was very eager to see me right away. He had this fantastic deal on. So over the phone before he arrived, he gave me his birthday, his hour, everything about it. And so I erected the chart. When he came, I told him I'm so convinced of this good fortune following his way to die. That... I can close the book on it. He said to me, Mrs. Carpenter, if you tell me the truth, I will give you a hundred dollars. And she said, so confidently, you will give it to me now. Because it has to work today. And she gave me all the reasons which I knew I taught them to her. How will it have to work today? Because of this transiting mode over these certain aspects of the chart. He said, no, if it works, you will get it today. But I will not give it to you now. I said, what's wrong with that? Well, she said, I wrote, I made up this chart from a bound volume of ephemerity. I was sitting at the open wind, it's hot. And so I turned away, I was diverted, and when I went back, I didn't realize the wind had blown over the pages. And I erected a chart of a man who was born ten years before this man. This man wasn't even born. I progressed by chart from this horoscope made up ten years before the birth of this man. I said, Mama, did you believe it when you spoke to him? She said, certainly I did. I said, forget it. Just completely forget it. It's done. I was in her room, our sweeter rooms, that night, around eight, when Augustan Union Bowie came upstairs and delivered a chuck. A Western Union check for one hundred dollars. And the trout was girl of a man who wasn't born. He was born ten years after this chart of a man. But Nora cannot sell work because she feels they all believe in me. She cannot buy the pearl of great price. Because she feels her only security is to get her little small shape from the railroad in Pennsylvania 
and our smile check from the schoolhouse in Scranton, Scranton, Pennsylvania. I'm eager out with this so she cannot give up and buy the pearl. You've got to give up every belief in this world in a power outside of Christ to buy Christ. There is nothing but Jesus Christ. You either believe in him or you don't believe in him. And any little reservation for a rainy day, it'll rain. So, you want back the belief in stars, but I'm confessing. Having done it so successfully over the years, I still carried in my mental furniture my chart. And so you see, you could always justify a failure. And as Blake said, self justification is the voice of hell. I didn't know it. In the God, everyone is justifying himself. No matter what he does, if it's a failure, he justifies it. Because you have the reasons in the world. But one is not a place outside of earth, it's right here. So we are in the hell justifying failure. Which I couldn't do it because look at my Venus. And then as soon as Venus just beyond the point where it interferes with me, but I thought of it Mercury. And so there I go. I went in spite of Venus and Murphy, something happens. Oh, why didn't I see that? But then it was all alone. A man goes back and reflects and then again justifies. No, he won't and so all that he had and bought it. All that he had, not a few things. You can't just buy it with a few of the things that you will dispose of. Yet you can use it, use it wisely and successfully, but you don't really possess him, that pearl, unless you buy him, and you can only buy him when you sold everything that you have when they buy him. And so, well, it's all out or nothing. So he who is not with me is against me. And I know it's the difficult thing, but is it worthwhile having? When you consider by having Christ Jesus, you are rising into a world of an entirely new order, where everything is subject to your imaginative thought. You're not here at all. You're moving with the world of death into the world of life when you find it. And making one with you. Well, you take it. Then let me tonight. In a quick summary, will take me no more than one minute to do it. Two minutes, the most. You take this pattern. It's going to happen to you. Cross affection is over. For Ara, you aren't going to be crucified. I have been crucified with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is Galatians, second chapter, 20th verse. The sixth of Romans. We have been united with Christ in the death I give. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like it. Listen to the tenses. If we have been united with Christ in a death like his, that's past. Change of tense. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like it. That's to be. Now we are told there are those who are misleading the people by teaching that the resurrection is over and past. Resurrection is what it's to be. It is taking place one after the other. So believe me, the crucifixion came first. That's over. The second stage in the unfolding drama is resurrection. Second stage, when man awakes in a grave, to find that he was all along dead, or he wouldn't awake in the grave. You don't put anyone in the tomb unless he's dead. So you awake in the 